That's right, y'all. We need justice right now. We need transparency right now. We need accountability right now. Today here at the state capitol, I'm with the state coalition that is actually uh, representing SB 1421, which is a bill that's titled The Right to Know, how we should be entitled to know if we got band officers working in our community, if I'm selecting a doctor to perform surgery on me and I wanted to know about his history, I can look that up, get his history, and know if he had any malpractice suit against him. You know, we have a right to know. If uh, I want to get me an attorney for a case that I'm filing, and I want to know if this attorney is a good attorney, all I have to do is Google the state board, put his name in, and then I can see if there's been any um, uh, infractions placed on him as an attorney. And so we're saying through AB or SB 1421 is that we should have the right to know what kind of community uh, or what kind of officers are working in our community and what kind of history they have. This bill is very imperative that we get this to pass because we need to be able to establish a pattern of behavior with these officers. We've come to find that some officers showed up on multiple calls for help and now the loved ones are dead by the same officer. So there's a pattern. Um, we need to know that. Oscar Grant, my nephew, was murdered on January 1st, 2009 at the Fruitvale Bark Station. This murder centered around a white commuter alleging that there was a black and Latino gang fight. Many deaths around the country happened because somebody white felt that they needed to call the police. Oscar Grant was punched. He was called a bitch ass nigga. He was thrown to the floor. Oscar was 160 pounds. Johannes Mesley is 6'7", 270 pounds, and Tony Peroni is 6'1", 250 pounds. He has 600 pounds of officer on his 160 pound frame. He was restrained, but yet Johannes Mesley claimed that he thought Oscar was reaching for a gun. Stood up, pulled his revolver out, and shot Oscar in the back. Bullet goes through his body, hit the pavement floor, bounced back up, hits him in the chest, and collapsed his lung. And the city of Oakland expressed himself from just an inherent activism culture from the original Black Panthers and the, the, the 70s movement and everything that has happened in the Bay Area came to a head that night when Oscar was murdered. We connected with Labor, the Longshoremen Union, Local 10, who shut down the ports, and we connected with many clergy and courageous political people. And because of that combination, we got for the first time in California state history an officer arrested, charged, convicted, and sent to jail. He only did 11 months, but that happened because of the community uprising. The Oscar Grant movement morphed into the Occupy Oakland movement. People that was in the Oscar Grant movement, the Occupy movement, coined a letter to black people, and Black Lives Matter came into existence. We were just tired of seeing people being killed and nobody held accountable. Because after Oscar, there's been over 10,000 more bodies killed. There are families here that have waited 10 years for justice. 10 years to know the name of the police officer that killed their loved one. We have families here that have spent thousands of dollars out of their own pockets just to know the name of police officers. I'm Teresa Smith, the mother of Cesar Cruz, who was killed by five police officers in Anaheim, shot 15 times in the back while he was still strapped in a seatbelt. I didn't know who killed Cesar for like about over a year and a half. And that was because I was told by a journalist. I never heard from the police department, from the district attorney. This is hard for families when you don't know who took your, who took your loved one's life. You know, they say they don't want to give out those names because of retaliation. They've never been retaliated. We just want to know who killed our loved ones. Here in, in liberal California, it's liberal California, they have more killings than they do anywhere else in the country. My grandson, who was 19 years old, was murdered on January the 16th, 2011, in Oakland, California. My grandson was not armed. He was shot in the back. And he was running away from whoever his assailants were. And they shot him right through the heart. Two weeks before he was murdered, he told me that every time he stepped outside of his door, the police were harassing him. They had taken his ID. They would strip search him. At one point, they had taken his girlfriend. They pulled his car over, took the car and his girlfriend, and, and um, left him standing. 
on the highway. My son had been arrested by the police and accused of second degree murder. They lied to get my son convicted. The same policeman that put my son in prison was over the investigation of my grandson. And these police came after me because I said that they lied to get my son convicted. And this is how they terrorize our community. It's no different than the, the, the KKK, which is the Ku Klux Klan. It's no different than the white militia that they would send after us. What they did to my son was they said they didn't kill him. But my baby's blood speaks loud and clear, the blood spatter outside. So they felt very comfortable in trying to cover up the fact that they shot him. They planted evidence, they did everything. I'm here for my husband, which is James Nate Greer. On May 23rd, 2014, he was killed by the police. He was driving down the street in the left turn lane and decided to go straight. So he waited for the light to turn green and proceeded to go straight. And he got pulled over. About 20 officers showed up and they basically tackled him to the ground. Um, and for 15 minutes, they tag team like an MMA fight, taking turns, um, wrestling with him, tasing him, choking him. Eventually he lost consciousness and he was turning blue. So they wrapped him in a body restraint and they threw him over to the side for six more minutes without any medical assistance. At the time an officer said he's not breathing and still six minutes later they didn't check his pulse or anything like that and they, they basically watched him die. After he died I started to research policies in our area and I found that because he wasn't killed by a firearm in Alameda County, California, they didn't, re they didn't ha um, have to report his death to the district attorney. So it went unknown for two years. And I realized that something wasn't right. So when I researched surrounding counties, all in custody deaths were reportable. So that's when I talked to the district attorney and I had that policy changed in Alameda County. My son was assassinated by police in Stockton, California on August the 16th, 2016. He was sleeping here. And then an hour later, here he is. He shot down like an animal. At two in the afternoon, he just woke up and went outside, go to the corner store to come back, and this is what happened. Shot up by Officer David Wells. He have, um five children. That's when his son was born. That's him with the other baby. My son, Petey, he was 24 years old. My son was in a black neighborhood. Um, he, um, he was referred to as the white boy because he was a little out of place, but he knew everybody down there, so he was very much at home. It's these police that, that go down into these neighborhoods that have this mindset that, that they're in the jungle. My son was intoxicated. Uh, he was at a, a liquor store trying to get some more. The cop uh, singled him out and stopped him. He was with another guy that was just as intoxicated as he was. And he also was with a 59-year-old grandmother. The cop pulled him away from the other two people. He already knocked my son to the ground, had his arm twisted behind his back, was trying to put handcuffs on him, couldn't get the other arm because my son landed on the other arm. Uh, at that point, my son uh, twisted out from underneath there, and, uh, and the cop backed up, pulled his gun out, and shot him three times in the chest. The cop already knew he was unarmed. And the lawyers for him, basically all they say was, tell him you feared for your life, and we'll get you off of this. This cop tries to say that my son uh, grabbed at his weapon, and so therefore he feared for his life. We had six witnesses that state that my son did not reach for the officer's weapon. He tried to say that the store owner had called them because there was a disturbance at the store. Well, that's straight up wrong. He tried to say he confronted my son in the store when in fact he confronted my son about 50 feet away from the front of the store. Since that happened, I had several police officers from the same department tell me about this officer how he was originally recommended for non-hire. He got sent back to the training academy three different times, but his brother-in-law was a detective and got him on the force. Just recently, we were able to get the city to do an investigation by someone other than the police department. They came back with the findings that there was use of excessive force, but they only report to the police chief and the mayor. They they're not allowed to give this information out to anybody else. We just got some more sad news concerning Mario Wood shooting in San Francisco, who was executed by at least nine officers, shot over 
28 times and was killed. And today, the district attorney announced that there will be no charges to the officers that actually killed him in cold blood. When somebody gets killed, law enforcement gives like a big donation to the district attorney and the district attorney says, case closed, we're not going to investigate. Even if the person was not armed, even if the person was shot in the back. One of the most extreme ways and, and consistent ways that black women and brown women experience state violence is through sexual assault at the hands of law enforcement. It was revealed that Jasmine Absalom had been sexually assaulted, raped, by over a dozen officers of the Oakland Police Department and many more officers from law enforcement agencies across the state. When police officers plant evidence or when they sexually assault a member of the public, or when they kill someone, when they use excessive force, the public has a right to know. Our police department in Oakland gets 60% of our general fund, and we believe in prevention rather than criminalization. So what would it look like to take half of what they get out of the general fund and redirect that into things like housing, education, jobs? Our unhoused population has exploded. We have 6,000 people sleeping on the streets of Oakland every single night. Oakland used to be um, a heavily black city. Now we're just a quarter of, of the population. Artists, the culture keepers that people flock to our city for, literally can't afford to live there. You can't go to a corner in Oakland without seeing high-rise condos that are being built for people that that can afford $4,000 a month, you know, two bedroom, one bedroom apartments. About six months ago, I started getting many requests, you know, Kat, please run for mayor. So we're building a platform in partnership with the people of Oakland that will be what we go in there and we get done. And so again, we're talking about divesting from police. We're asking the California legislator to have some backbone, to stand up to police unions and say no more. Our loved ones are gone in the flesh, but they're still here in the spirit, and they're asking and they're pleading for us to get this law passed. Are we going to let California legislators say we do not have access to information? No. no. What